Hello, my name is Yemi. And my name is Ichoma. And together we host Africa in My Kitchen, a podcast that is produced by Tunuka Media. This fun podcast explores meals from each country in Africa. We talk about the country, discuss the meal itself, and draw from our experiences to share why we are, or are not, excited about the meal. A new episode airs every two weeks. So join us for the hits, the misses, the laughs, and the cringes as we eat our way across the continent. Come back often, share with your friends, and add the podcast to your regular podcast rotation wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, it's time for this week's episode. Hello, 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 Afro food venturers. This is a thing that apparently we're going to make sticks, so yeah. It is a thing. Hi. We hope you have a wonderful Christmas. And if you're still off work or school, congratulations, you lucky thing. Right? Do you ever get confused about which day it is? You know that period between Christmas and New Year, like Mm -hmm. 27, 26? Mm Mm-hmm. Whenever I'm off during that week, like the days kind of blend into each other and I'm not really sure what date it is. Does that happen to you? Oh, yeah, it does. Usually it's more like I judge it based on which outfit I wore. I was like, okay, so this is Monday sweatpants and so Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday sweatpants. <laughs> you know. Wednesday onesie. How do you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, guys, if you don't have a onesie, woo, man, babies are enjoying. I'm just saying onesies are so comfy. Eh? Mm. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that being said, it is also one day to the end of 2020. Saying it wasn't the best year is putting it mildly, but all things considered, we choose to be thankful. The only other thing we have to say is 2021. Please. 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 We are begging. Please. Be kind. Please be kind. You know, we are just begging, Shat. You know. Be Please. kind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not laughing. Please be kind. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, welcome to the final episode of the year, but also our final episode of the season. Yeah. We're going to be taking a short break on Africa in my kitchen, but not for long. Nope, because you know I like food, so I can't stay away too long. So yes, guys, we'll be back in a couple of months before you know it. And while we're away, we have older episodes that can keep you entertained. You can also look more into the dishes we talked about or try to taste them. Or, if you're feeling bold, even make them. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Yep, and come on to social media on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and the blog and tell us about your experiences or even ask any questions you have about the dish. Okay, friends, let's jump right in. Today we're in Ethiopia and our proverb of the day goes like this. After the hyena has gone, the dog barks. What does this even mean? Does it mean people run their mouths after the big guns have left? You know what this reminds me of? What? Have you ever heard this say, you tell them waka for pockets? No. Okay. Everybody, come along with me. You know, you know. Oh, now I understand what it means. Yeah. Just, so essentially, there is a thing in Nigeria where if you put all your five fingers open palm towards someone, it's kind of saying like your mama. Your mother, yeah. Waka. Right? Yeah, so it's called waka. And it's like saying like your mama. But... um. What people say as like a joke is that if you're kind of a coward, you say you do the five finger gesture, but you put your hands in your pocket. So uh. the person that you're insulting <laughs> can't see. see, can't see. But in your mind, in your heart of hearts, you've insulted them, mm-hmm. but they can't see it because, you know, they're going to beat you up or something. <laughs> it's like, so this is what reminds me, like, tell them, like, waka for pockets, like you're putting, doing waka from your pocket. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's, that can be me sometimes because you can see I'm, Five feet to five feet two of glory. Mm. So I can't fight. No. I can't run very fast because my legs are short. But can I insult people? I can. So I think that could be me. Like and I'll run from my far. mouth. Uh, from far. I'll run my mouth up until the moment they come. In fact, Ijama, like, <laughs> Ijama is a very good wordsmith. So she probably sends a very strongly worded email <laughs> <laughs> or text. And then when the person shows up, I'm like, oh, you, you, you came here, did you? Hi. <laughs> I can run a little bit, but I don't like to fight because, yeah, I don't need to mess up. I know, like coconut oil has been invested in this skin. Exactly. You know, all the mm-hmm. nightly routines can't be messed up by, you know, my gab. So <laughs> I probably would, maybe I probably would send a strongly worded email or, yeah, that would probably be my, that would probably be my way. I don't think I can, like, I can't fight. No, oh. I've never. 
Oh. I've never been in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody, please. I have I have street cred to maintain. Oh, okay, yeah, now no one knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Like we were saying, friends, anyway, we are in Ethiopia and our dish is a big deal Ethiopian dish. It is regarded as Ethiopia's national dish and there are some seriously intense emotions attached to it. We are talking about an Ethiopian chicken stew called Dorowat. No kidding about national love for Dorowat. I watched a YouTube video where this lady made chicken stew, like not Dorowat, just her own chicken stew. And some Ethiopian viewers thought it was Dorowat and they went in on her for not making it properly. It was quite intense. Before we go into Dorowat some more, let's just give you some background information about Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the second most populated country in Africa, with a population of about 114 million. The capital is Addis Ababa, and Addis Ababa is the headquarters of the African Union. Can I just say, Ethiopia is the second most populated country in Africa, with 114 million. Mm -hmm. Yami, Nigeria has 206 million people. (laughs) You know what? We need to spread our blessings around. That's why we are just plenty. Like, like how many? We are over our our a hundred our... million more than the second most populated country. Yes, our cup overflow it. My God. <laughs> okay. Ethiopia has over eighty ethnic groups. The largest ethnic groups are the Oromo, the Amhara, Somalis, and Tigrayans, who together make up about seventy four percent of the population. There are over 90 languages spoken in Ethiopia, but Oromo and Amharic are two of the most widely spoken in the country. Amharic is the working language of the federal government. Ethiopia was occupied by Italy from 1936 until after the Second World War, but not officially colonized. Because of this, it is considered as one of two African countries that have never been colonized by Europe. Ethiopia is bordered by Kenya to the south, South Sudan to the southwest, Sudan to the northwest, Eritrea to the north, Djibouti to the northeast, and Somalia to the east. A few weeks ago, remember guys, we talked about Eritrean cuisine and how a big part of that cuisine is made up of different kinds of stews that you eat with a flatbread called injera. Mm -hmm. This is also true in Ethiopia. In fact, some Ethiopian and Eritrean stews are very similar, but may go by different names. So just as an example, our featured dish today is Dorowat, but it's also eaten in Eritrea and it's called Sebi Doro. Okay. So, let's tell you a little bit about Ethiopian food. Like Ijama said, there are a variety of stews and they are often had with injera. The Amharic word for stew is wat. In Ethiopia, we have sirowat, a chickpea and bean flour stew. Misirwat is a lentil stew and kewat is a beef stew. There's a breakfast dish called chekchepsa, kitafirfir or kitafitfit. You first make the kids a flat bread from wheat flour, then shred the bread, fry it in netere kebe and a little berebere. If you were with us in Eritrea, netere kebe is a clarified spiced butter that is called tesmi in Eritrea and berebere is a red spiced blend that contains a large mix of spices including hot chili or cayenne pepper, cumin, fenugreek and cardamom. It is spicy but in flavor, not in heat. We will talk about both ingredients a little later in the story. There is also injera fit fit or injera fir fir. This is leftover injera that you tear into small rolls or pieces and soak in stew overnight. You eat it with breakfast the next day. Yeah. And actually, I tried to do that because I had a lot of leftover injera. And I'm because I'm not big on injera, like I've, we've talked about this before, I was like, well, what do I do with all of this injera? Because injera is huge. It is. Like when you buy one, like one piece, I guess, or one slice of injera, it's humongous mm-hmm. so i actually tried that i did a mix i think it was like combining kitchen fit fit with something else because i took injera and i tore it up into bits and then i fried it in berbere and some clarified butter and kebab mm-hmm. and then i was like okay this is still sour my my point was just to mask the taste of the sourness and then i now poured some doro what's inside and mixed everything together <laughs> just ate the concussion one popular drink in ethiopia is tej Tej is a honey wine that is drunk on festive occasions. I've also seen one recipe that called for you to add Tej to Durowat as an option. The alcohol content of Tej is about 7 to 11%. Coffee is also popular, and we talked a little bit about Ethiopian coffee in our special 
earlier this year. It was called Coffee and Donuts. If you haven't listened to it, go listen. It is delicious. <laughs> to listen to? <laughs> I mean, if you need to make yourself hungry, I'm telling you, it's, it it's is a, pretty delicious. It's a delicious listen, guys. Mm-hmm. Regarding food in Ethiopia, there is Derek Tibbs, and that is seasoned beef that is fried in butter and served with a better, better sauce. And it's eaten with injera. There is gomen, which is collard greens fried in butter. And then if you add beef, garlic, and some additional vegetables, it becomes gomen besiga. There is dulet, which is minced tripe with liver and lean beef. And you cook this in cardamom and pepper, onions, and some chili and some butter. And then there is kitfo, which is raw minced beef mixed with mm. a spice blend mm-hmm. and the spice blend is called uh, mimita and then mm. you mix it with kibbe as well which is the clarified butter we talked about if you're too scared for raw meat you can try leb leb which is slightly cooked kitfo now if you think this kitfo raw beef was not for the faint of heart let us tell you about tera siga tera siga literally means raw meat and that's something else that's eaten so it's just chunks of raw meat that you eat with spice and injera so with kitfo you mix it with a spice blend mm-hmm um, and then there's the option for you to have it slightly cooked. But this one is actually like meat that you just... So you just be eating the meat like that? Yeah. To be honest, I'm not really sure what the big difference is between the two. But it's like one is minced, one is whole. Uh, dear listeners, as you know, me, I have stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm telling you, I have hmm, stories for these. So hmm, this uh, kitfo, right? So when we were chit-chatting about the menu for this dish and I mentioned to Ijama, I was like, Kitfo, that sounds familiar. But hmm, now I remember. Years ago, so I had met this friend of mine and we were going to eat. Um, and, you know, being the trusting human that I am, because I wasn't familiar with anything that was on the menu. This is why you should listen to Africa in My Kitchen podcast, yes, because now you. you become more familiar with things on menus. Okay? <laughs> Just... We're doing you a public service. Anyway, I was not familiar with anything on the menu. And I allowed her pick my meal. So, you know, generally it's more like a shared, mm-hmm. like a communal shared thing. And so she picked Kitfo as one of it. Hmm. People, your sister carried injera. That was the first time I had injera. Carried injera. And I was eating this thing. And I was like, ah, it tastes kind of strange, though. But Wait, the injera <laughs> or the injera and the Kitfo? The Kitfo. Oh, okay. I, the kid for itself. I was like, my thought to myself was, this tastes kind of strange. It's interesting. You know, I don't hate it, but nice. Um, and it was funny because I was like, what is this? And she's like, oh, just taste it a little bit. I swear to God, I should stop believing people that just say, yummy, just taste it. When someone says just taste it without telling you what is it. Uh, anyway, my dear brothers and sisters, she now told me it's raw meat that I was eating that had spices. Even though the thing was sweet, so I, I can't lie, that food was actually sweet. So it was nice. It was nice. Oh, but then why? The, but the fact that I now knew, you know, when psychology jumps in, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, ah, so I've been eating raw food, uncooked meat, uncooked meat. Beef. <laughs> and I said, wait, is it pickled meat? She said, no, it's raw. It's not dried. <laughs> it's not cured. It's not dried. This is the meat is wet. It's not like cured, dried, air fried, nothing. I was not like, okay, hmm. the way I respected myself and shifted my, my, my taste. I was just eating. I just started eating injera and drinking water. That's how I, <laughs> literally, that's, that's how I finished that meal. Like I just stopped eating it. I was like, you know, that's part of our issue as humans, right? And why I really love this African My Kitchen podcast and the journey we are on tasting things from different countries. Mm-hmm. Because psychologically, I kind of didn't like it, but it tasted good. Mm-hmm. actually go- it didn't taste bad like it was actually tasting good i mean i was i was you know shoving she that was shoveling it i was shoving it down my before they told me what it was i was just like mm, this is interesting it's a little tangy but you know <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of human uh, animal musk <laughs> <laughs> anyway okay let's uh let's move on to talk about our feature dish dodo what dodo what is an onion-based chicken stew that is also filled with hard-boiled eggs um, we've kind of laid the groundwork for you guys, told you this dish was a big deal in Ethiopia. So there was a lot of pressure. There was also a lot of, it, it's kind of hard. I found that it was difficult to find a lot of recipes in English. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I look everywhere for recipes. I checked on YouTube. A lot of them were not in English, but I found a couple. 
and then they would be slightly different from the ones I would find online that would tell you different things. Where online, like Instagram or something? Um, just the website. So like okay. searching like online. Just web pages, yes. okay. Web pages. And even on Instagram, people will tell you they're making Dodo what, but they wouldn't say exactly all the key ingredients that go into mm. it. And I was a bit nervous. I was like, well, it's hard to find like everybody saying something consistent. Obviously, people are going to make things according to their households. But I wanted to do this dish justice. The other thing I was worried about was I heard that this thing can take eight hours to make the proper way. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, I'm not going to make this for eight hours. And then I saw something else that said your whole, your entire house will smell like onions for days. And I had my hair in, like, you know, I don't want my clothes. And you know when you fry plantain and your whole house smells wow. like plantain? Yeah. Eva. Okay. Yeah. You know. Uh, so I was a bit concerned and a bit worried, but I was like, okay, no, let's, let's, let's do this. Um, so the key thing you want to know about Dorowat is it has a lot of onions. And by a lot of onions, I mean a lot of onions. For making a pot of Dorowat, you need about five pounds of onions for like a whole chicken, say 12 pieces of chicken. This translates to maybe like 10 large onions. And if you check on the blog, you see the pictures of how much we use. And that being said, I would like to give a special shout out to someone who stepped in and helped and responded when I asked for how much we should use in terms of onions. Uh, med school dropout check her out on instagram m-e-d-s-k-u-l-d-r-o-p-o-u-t that is her instagram handle so the first thing you need is your onions and then of course you have your chicken now the chicken in ethiopia when traditionally making doro what the very traditional way the chicken is cut a specific way into 12 pieces and there are actually videos online that will teach you how to cut this so i cut it i think somehow i don't know why but i ended up cutting it into like 13 pieces or 14 pieces so even with video i didn't follow instructions i'm not a very good person with video i mean i don't have the time but i came close and i think the number 12 for the chicken is significant i think it has to do with the 12 apostles of christ because i know ethiopia has a very deep rooted history in christianity so i think mm. that's linked to it so yeah your important ingredients are your onions and your chicken and then you have your bere bere which we've talked about before which is a combination of many spices like fenugreek, cumin, cayenne, and all of that. You have your kibe, which is the clarified spiced butter. Mm -hmm. And then you have something called makalesha. Makalesha is also a blend of spices, but I think the two key ones are cardamom and cloves. Apart from that, you have your lime that you use for washing the chicken. You have your hard-boiled eggs. You need salt and pepper to taste, and you need a blended mix of ginger and garlic. So to make doro what, the first thing you do is you wash your chicken with your lemon or lime, however it is that you clean your chicken. The cleaning of the chicken is very important. Traditionally, you skin your chicken as well, but there's no chicken police to tell you if you want to eat your doro what with chicken skin on. I think you should be fine. You chop your onions and you caramelize your onions. Now, the caramelization process depends. If you're making, like, with five pounds of onions, I think I would say anywhere from 15, about 15 minutes... 20 minutes the traditional way probably takes longer i've seen people say caramelize your onions for an hour so what you're going to do is you have a big pot filled with chopped onions and you slowly just start to heat it up and you just watch over it until it caramelizes very slowly you don't allow it to burn you keep watching it you add water it's a whole process and i think that's actually what takes up a big chunk of the cooking time so you caramelize your onions you add in your better better um, you fry everything together, allow it to cook a little bit more. And then you add your ginger and your garlic. You let it cook a little bit more. And then you add your whatever additional spices like salt or whatever it is that you need. And then you add your chicken, allow it to cook. Meanwhile, you have your hard-boiled eggs on the side, of course. Close to the end, you add your mekalesha. And then after that, you add your hard-boiled eggs and then everything cooks. Now, if you go online, you see different people use different things some people don't add mekalesha for instance mm -hmm. some people have varying cooking time some will tell you the whole thing takes three hours some will tell you it takes four honestly go with whatever it is that you can do with what you have mm -hmm. i do have a question for you so mm -hmm. when i saw one video and you made a good point about how not everyone is the same mm -hmm. so when i saw one video i noticed that she said that well when you add something then you close the pot then you add the other thing open the pot dump the thing inside then close the pot so essentially you are adding and then turning every single time because hers, mm -hmm. I think she cooked for about eight hours mm -hmm. and then she would turn the stew a little bit mm -hmm. below heat, turn it a little bit for mm -hmm. eight hours long. Mm -hmm. But So my question is, is that kind of how you did it or did you just add everything 
Like after adding the chicken, you added all the spices. No. Okay. Everything was in bits. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so it's the same process. Like you wait a bit and you wait a bit. What probably differed from hers is how long I waited because mm-hmm. I could not cook this for eight hours. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because Instant Pot mm-hmm. can step in. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Yemi, you go first. What were your thoughts? So I will start with the clarified butter because I remember before I even talk about the door, what's one of the ingredients was the clarified butter, mm-hmm. right? And so I remember having this conversation with the drama. We we're talking about the clarified butter and kind of like cilantro where some people taste it and it tastes bitter and some people taste it and it tastes amazing. Mm-hmm. We had differing views on it and I'll let her speak her mm-hmm. piece. But when I smelled it, I was like, this is kind of nice. Like I like the smell of the clarified butter. And to me, it almost smelled like caramel. Oh. Honestly, like, Dude, we had other mm. we had other witnesses there. Mm. I will not call their name, mm. but they were there, and they also smelled it, and it smelled like caramel. Mm. So I was like, "This this smells nice." I don't know what you're complaining about, woman. Please, you need to go and clean your nose very well. But on the doorway itself, I liked it. I liked the flavor of it. It was very different from what I tasted before. Mm-hmm. So the flavor was it of it was different. The consistency was different, but it was close to Fulimuam that we had. A few weeks ago when we talked about Democratic Republic of Congo. For me, it wasn't spicy. So there's no real there was no real spicy kick. To be fair, my spice tolerance and when I say spice I mean pepper, my spice tolerance is fairly high. So for me, I didn't really feel anything spicy in there. It had an almost creamyish texture. In terms of taste, it was, it was very unique. I don't it's really hard mm. to describe is that the taste was very, very unique. When you eat it, you'll know you're eating Dorowat. Yes. Like it's even when I was thinking of how to describe it for this episode, I really struggled because how do you describe something that doesn't taste like anything else you've really tasted before? Right? So for me, it wasn't spicy, but the flavor, and I think it's because it was cooked so long and some of that, the onion flavor really gets into the chicken. Though the highlight for me was the egg. I'm sorry. The egg. Yeah. <laughs> the egg. Hey, I was like, because at first I was like, this is weird. Why is there egg in stew? But then. You uh, never had egg in stew. Why, sh- why should people be putting egg inside stew? That's a big deal in Ghana. Or maybe that's why it's, it makes sense to me. Never yeah. Mind. That's why it's easier on that side. <laughs> so, yeah. So for me, I was just like, this is nice. And I liked how the flavor got into the egg. It got into everything. So there was nothing you tasted in the pot that the flavor had not seeped into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it even it's like even the chicken bone inside, you understand the soul of the chicken wherever it is, it accepted some of that flavor too. It was the entire soul, the soul wherever it is, it accepted it. This is a good meal. Now the other question, I didn't do the cooking, but I'll comment because why not? You know, the other thing is I'm not sure if I personally will ever cook it. Some of the food we've made, I'm like, well, I'll cook. I've made, and some of them I've actually made later. But I'm not sure if I'll ever cook this on my own because, I mean, it's ours. That's plenty. You know, that's already dinner time. You're making lunch. It's already dinner time by the time you start eating. So that timing is a lot. Big ups to Ethiopians. It is is, is pretty good. So you liked it a lot? I liked it. Mm -hmm. We'll probably never make it, but I'll (laughs) eat it if I ever see it. Okay. So for me, please, let's tie it back to this story about kibbeh because I feel like I need to defend myself. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is a clarified butter that Yemi could smell, and she said it reminded her of caramel. Whereas for me, when I sniffed it, my instant reaction was I moved So you recoiled? I recoiled. I don't know how to describe what it was. I'm starting to think in retrospect that I was also biased because of how I came about acquiring this kibbeh in the first place. Because there was a little bit of drama. Remember when I called you and said I thought I was in a shitty yeah. area? Yeah. She thought she was about to get robbed. It was yeah, quite yeah. It, funny. To most people that live in Edmonton, it's probably fine. But you see, I'm south side. I don't she, like coming so downtown. So she's in the burbs. Okay. Yeah. So she doesn't know the street life that's, you know. No, when I come downtown, I'm like, oh my God, my purse. I'm going to get killed. She's not about her life, you guys. She doesn't, not, she doesn't understand. I'm a baby girl for life. <laughs> So, <laughs> wow. Okay, bird mama. <laughs> so when I came to get it, like I'd made an, an arrangement with the storekeeper and she makes, and the giver was good and she was very nice. It's just, she told me, okay, come at a certain time because I make it from scratch. I get there and she's like, oh my God, you're the lady who called. I just sold it to someone. 
it's going to take me another 30 minutes. And I had parked my car far away. I was downtown. I had not know where to park. I didn't want my car to get towed. So I, was like, so I walked all the way here. And I have to go back and wait. And then I called Yami in a panic. I was like, well, should I go back to my car and wait? Do you think my car is safe where it is? And I was <laughs> like, girl, please. Like... <laughs> Just because you're from the Burbs, we don't have like a, a homing beacon or a signal on like a, this. She's not one on of a us. Get her car. You think the car was brand new, guys? This car is older than some children. <laughs> children that were born when they are now in high school. <laughs> so anyhow, maybe that's kind of why I was biased because I was annoyed. But here's the thing, though: Kiba is one of those things that I personally made because I smelt it and then. Um, I wasn't sure before Yemi could smell it. I smelled it and I thought maybe there was something wrong with it or that it was burnt. So I went to a different store and I got Kiba again. And it smelled slightly different, I think. Did you notice the difference between the two? Yes. One sm- oh, yeah. The second one is the one that smelled more like caramel. The first one smelled just like spicy sweet. Like, it was mm. nice. I don't know what you were No, I think... About. No, that like, caramel... This is, this is a surround throw situation right here. I think I think it is one of those situations, actually. The one that you smelled that you thought was caramel was the first one I got, actually. But it was the second one you smelled. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So, Kiba is like a yellow. It's clarified butter with spices in it. So, there is that. But let's talk about another thing that you mentioned. You said that you felt like the sauce had gotten through to everything. Mm -hmm. And something that's important that I should mention is that you should score your meat and your eggs. So you basically poke holes in them Mm. before you cook. Mm. And of course, you're cooking the meat from raw inside the stew, right? So that if you poke your holes in, that's when it's going to get in. And it's the same thing with the eggs, actually punctured holes. In fact, I think I was a bit too extra with the eggs because some of the pictures I, I, I looked at or when I was done, the egg looked like it had been attacked. <laughs> like, <laughs> there were just holes everywhere so that the stew could get right through even into the yolk. Because you were not about to make it a second time. <laughs> nope, I was not. What, after all that drama? Um, so what did I think about it? I kind of agree with you when you say when you eat it, you know it's Doro what. And I think that comes really from the berbere and the kibbe. Those are flavors that I guess neither of us have really tried before. Yeah. The idea of it is this is a red colored stew. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it instinctively, you might think there's tomatoes in it. And actually some recipes will tell you use tomato paste, but originally you don't need to. Um, It's really the berbere that gives it that color. My point is this is an onion stew. And the onions impart a sweetness because I tasted a little bit of sweetness Mm -hmm. in the stew. Um, But at the same time, it was still a bit savory. And it was just, I think this is a dish that has kind of exposed us to more Eastern and Northern spices. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we're not as familiar. We saw it a little bit in Djibouti, I think, as well. Yeah. So it's it's savory, a little bit sweet. Um, For me, it was still, it was chicken stew. It was a different kind of stew. And I think it was because I had put so much work into it. So you're like, this better pay off. This better pay off. And like you, I don't know if I would make it from scratch the same way, but I would definitely like to go and try it in a restaurant. Just because when I was making it, my friend's sister got so excited. She was like, it'll take you a long time, but you won't regret it. So I'm pretty sure she hasn't made it before, but she was egging me on. Yeah. So I wonder how much even better like it would taste made by an authentic, in an authentic Ethiopian restaurant or Eritrean restaurant if it's that Sebi Doro. Yeah, and food just tastes better when someone else makes it. That's true. <laughs> That's actually true. I, I sometimes I, I, I literally finish cooking and I'm just like, Ugh. I'm too tired to eat. Yeah. yeah. The other thing though that leads me to something else, guys. I've never believed that the cooking time or the most traditional way of cooking should kind of dictate whether or not you make a dish. Do with it whatever you can. I did not make it for eight hours. Maybe mm-hmm. it was like three, three or three and a half hours, which is still kind of long. Mm-hmm. Enter instant pot. Or if you don't have one, a pressure cooker. Um, I guess so. The thing with the instant pot, though, is that I, I haven't seen a lot of people who have made Dodo what that way. Mm. So they will tell you how to do it. I did find, and I'll put this on the blog, I found a lot of resources mm. and about people using instant pot. And I found this particular one, and I tried to make Dodo what again with the instant pot. Mm-hmm. It wasn't bad. Like, you use the rice button. Okay. And... I think I was done in under an hour. Oh. Yeah. So, Look at you innovating. I know. But this time, I think I put too much ginger and garlic, so it came out with an extra savory, zingy mm. stew. But I would say definitely, um, I'll put all those resources out there. Don't let us telling you it takes eight hours stop you from trying it. And there are some very lazy ways as well on the internet that will probably make Ethiopian people very upset. Yes. But honestly, I think once you have the better, better spice, 
and you have the kebe, just do with it what you can. The flavor is so distinct that you will have an idea to some degree of what doro would taste like versus something else. Do you see what yeah. I'm going? Yeah. I do. The only thing is don't make something completely different no, and decide that please. you're... Do not Jamie don't, Oliver. Don't, don't, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't Jamie Oliver this dish. Don't do your take on Doro Watts. <laughs> no. Well, if you do, we didn't tell you to do it. You can do it, but we did not sanction it. Yeah, thou shall not be appropriating. You can kind of find ways to cut the process short, but mm-hmm. don't do your own take on it. No, don't appropriate. Just be appropriate. You know, well, don't appropriate. Be appropriate. I'm you sure know, you feel ah, smart. I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and just to give an example of what that could look like, um, like we said, you can find these things. Well, I got my better better and my kibbe and my makalesha from an Ethiopian store. But let's say you, for some reason you can't get there. Some websites will tell you mix this, 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 and that will give you an approximation of better better. So you can actually make your own spice blend. So you can blend. kind of make your own mm-hmm. spice blend if you're feeling that. Or you can just run and grab. But honestly, I feel like once you've grabbed the authentic stuff, the concept, you can, you know, you can use the same ingredients and mm-hmm. maybe reduce the cooking time. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I'm getting at. Efficiency. I'm not saying, efficiency. Yes. Don't go and add, I don't know, ragu or something. Oh. Or if you do, don't tell anybody because they'll come for you hard. Ethiopia seems to be very passionate about Dorowat. Mm-hmm. Well, I think all in all, we both like Dorowat. Mm-hmm. What we also agree on is we don't like the cooking time. No. So what I will be very happy to do is eat Dorowat at someone's house or in a <laughs> restaurant don't ask me to cook it. Ain't nobody got time for that. But even with that, it was a very good meal. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this brings us to the end of this episode as well as oh, as well as the end of our last episode for the season. Everyone, oh. We want to say thank you guys. We're going to get a little bit in our feelings here. Mm-hmm. We started this in March and we started from Algeria and now we are in Ethiopia. We've tried a lot of dishes. We've learned a lot. We've seen you guys engage with us from different parts of the world. Like yes, Yemi, like what a bunch of random countries I didn't even know. Actually, for some of the countries, I was I'll talk to Yemi. I'll be like, do you do you know anyone in this country that's maybe listening? And she's like, no. I'm like, yes, no. Now because sometimes you be like, is it our uncle uh, or auntie uh, uh, that's yeah, listening? You no, know, as a show of support. No, this is it's been really awesome from from even like from Morocco, from parts of France, like. It's been it's been wild, mm-hmm. and we've had like a ton of fun doing this. We have me sometimes more than Ijeoma because I show up and just yeah, eat. she just <laughs> eats the food. <laughs> so we really appreciate all the love. Um, we want to say again, we'll only be gone for a short time. This is not mm-hmm. a breakup message. We're coming back no. with more recipes, more stories, more laughs. She can't leave me anywhere she lives. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> Hopefully. Not many more blunders because, you know, this season alone, I did a couple of things. Yeah, we love you for it anyway. Thank you. We will also have, along with our new episodes for next season, some more specials coming your way. So Mm -hmm. look out for those. Yeah. And I don't want to have to re-say what Ijema has said. Like, I'm very, very grateful for everyone who has engaged with us Mm -hmm. for all the listen and downloads. Like, every time, like... What? Yeah, even the people that randomly slide into our DM. Yes. Slide yes. in to give us words of encouragement. Thank you so much. They, those, we see them, we appreciate them, and we always respond. Um, you guys are A+. I, I just must say that. And th- you've made something that came as a concept for a blog mm-hmm. turned into a podcast. You've made it very, very worthwhile. Yes, you have. So that's it for today, folks. And that's it for season one. Stay safe, be kind, and here's to a positive attitude and hoping for a great 2021. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening, friends. As a reminder, the podcast is released every two weeks. Follow Tunuka Media on social media, including Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to connect with us and be on the forefront of upcoming shows and program schedules. Links are in the show notes. Africa in My Kitchen is produced by Tunuka Media and co-hosted with 234 Pantry. So while on Instagram, follow my page, 234 Pantry, for more food-related content and fun facts about dishes and ingredients. 
Tunuka Media also produces another show called Overlooked, which I host, with more shows on the way. Like and subscribe, and if you learn something new, support the show by giving Africa in My Kitchen a high rating wherever you listen. This helps the show grow and gets more people, just like you, to learn also. So until next time, bye! bye.